Hello, welcome everybody. I'm Bruce Campbell and I'll be your host for the evening. Our presentation tonight is entitled, Accelerate Your Life Saving, How to Go from 50 to 90% Live Release Rate Really Fast. It's the fourth installment of our series of life-saving webcasts featuring dynamic animal welfare leaders from across the country. But before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you'll ask questions during the presentation. Please get your questions in early because those submitted late in the presentation might not be processed in time for a response during the presentation. In the green file widget at the bottom of your screen, you'll find the presentation handout, which you can download and print, as well as links to other valuable resources. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the help widget at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours, should you want to view it again. Tonight, our speaker is Dr. Kim Sanders, the Director and Veterinarian at Anderson County Paws in Anderson County, South Carolina. After completing her doctorate of veterinarian medicine from St. George's University in 2009, Dr. Sanders quickly found her calling in shelter medicine. She is a passionate teacher to shelter directors on how to implement best practices and save lives, and is focused on saving shelter animals in not only Anderson County, but all over South Carolina. When not at the shelter, you can find her playing with her pit bulls or loving on her donkeys. Dr. Sanders, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Bruce. So good evening, and we're going to get started tonight on our presentation, 90% um, in 90 days is the short version. And uh, there's a, a lot of best practices in here, so it's kind of a compilation of life-saving practices. So if you've been watching most of these uh, webinars along the way, a lot of these practices are going to sound very familiar to you already. Uh, we, when I started at Anderson County Paws as the director and veterinarian, the euthanasia rate was um, enormous, and so we were euthanizing over 50% of the animals. And within 90 days, we were able to implement some life-saving programs that brought us to an over 90% save rate. So you're talking three months of really, really hard work that enabled us to save thousands of animals. So a lot of what you're going to hear tonight will be, you know, common sense and best practices. Um, but, you know, one thing to remember was that it, you have to work smarter, not harder. Every day is difficult in the shelter, and you can spin your wheel, or you can become very progressive and actually make a lot of progress. So I will have a couple of questions for you guys in the end, just, so just think about them as we go along the presentation. Um, you know, some of those will be, what has been the most difficult program for you to implement in your community? You know, the, com the community is not always on board because they don't understand what we're trying to do. And so think about that and how is one way that we can help you change that. Um, you know, we've, we've had some great success in changing programs in our community and getting the community support behind us. So, so think about what has been really difficult for you and, and how someone can help you change that program around. Um, one of the other questions I will have is what fears prevent you from moving forward with the best practices that we have been able to implement in, in our facility? So there's always a story in the past about someone trying to claim a dog that wasn't theirs as an, as an owner claim or someone trying to steal a particular animal. And because of that complaint or problem, certain strict policies were put into place. And a lot of times those policies are very, very difficult and they really go against life saving. So you know, think about some of those fears that are instilled in your own facility and that you've just practice for years on, on end without necessarily even thinking about. And, you know, how can we go about removing some of those barriers, removing some of those fears, and really doing what's best for the animals and going ahead and moving forward and being able to save more lives. So I will uh, we'll get started. So here is a outline of my presentation for the evening. Um, I, we, our shelter is located in Anderson County which is halfway between Charlotte and Atlanta. So we've got a, a great little location there. The, um, the South is known for, for many things. So Sweet Tea, um, South Carolina in particular, is known for Myrtle Beach and the Clemson Tigers. But the South has not done a fantastic job as far as saving animals. 
and I think that's an, an area where we have really struggled over the years. And you know, I think the, um, the problems were were widely known in our area as far as the number of animals that were being euthanized. Um, so to continue with the outline, change finally arrived, and so I'll kind of discuss what happened, what was the, the catalyst to bring that change to Anderson County, and then our policy and procedures. And, you know, one of the most important things you can have in place is a, a set policy so that everybody knows what your standard of care is, so that everybody knows what your procedures are, so that you have these great ordinances in place. Or if they're not great, you need to be able to recognize your roadblocks and know what you need to, um, to move forward on, need to improve upon. Um, and then SOPs. I know everyone probably dreads the word SOP and hates writing them and reading them and, and trying to improve upon them. But they are just crucial for any large organization. You know, we, we bring in new staff members weekly um, or monthly, and it's really, really important that everybody gets that same message. That's been a big thing for me um, in the last two and a half years as a, as a new director is the game of telephone. Um, I'm always amazed at what I say versus what I hear that comes back around. So having those SOPs in place is really crucial. So when, when I first became in, um, involved in PAUSE, was, there was a lot of drama. And with the, the euthanasia was, um, was really being focused on the public. The public was very upset. And, you know, they, they were really causing a lot of problems. They were going to county council and, um, and really just voicing their opinion for good reason. And so we had to, to take a look at some of the best practices there in order to save the, the animals and, and make some serious changes in, in, our, in our community. So the dog here, his name is Duke, and Duke was one of the largest catalysts for all the change that came to Anderson County, and so I will never forget him. Um, I never met him personally, but, uh, but, but I have him to thank for the way that my career has taken path. So for Anderson County, our intake in 2015 was about 7,700 animals. The save rate for, um, to combine was about 48%. And Duke was a heartworm positive dog that had an adopter that was interested um, in adopting him, and he was supposed to be picked up the, the very following day after surgery, but he was euthanized instead. And there was no real excuse ever made as to why he was euthanized. Um, but that, that started the public outrage, and that started the phone calls and the emails and the, the angry citizens. Um, and then a few weeks later, there was a cat with a microchip that had been adopted out from a local rescue group that was euthanized, along with an entire room of cats, when one of those cats tested positive for, um, for panleukopenia. And so the, the entire room had been euthanized, and this particular cat had a microchip. And that rescue group would have gladly come and, and gotten the cat, but they weren't allowed to, and the cat was euthanized. So the only thing that had really changed in Anderson County um, since 2008 was that a failure clinic had opened, the Anderson County Humane Society. And that alone was enough to take the intake of animals from about 14,000 to where we were in 2015, which was at 7,700. So, you know, nothing changed at the shelter. The euthanasia rate was, was the same, you know, about 50%, um, but, but intake alone was drastically cut in half just by a spay-neuter facility opening up. So we're pretty lucky in our, our shelter. Um, we've got about 130 dog runs, digital x-ray, a full veterinary staff with two surgical suites sitting on 12 acres of land, um, with plenty of play space for, for the animal. Um, so we're, we're pretty spoiled in that aspect. But the one thing that wasn't happening was saving the animals in our, in our county. And so the public was absolutely furious. They had gone to the county council meetings. They had emailed. Um, you know, they were, were all over Facebook, as many of you have seen in the past with, with other facilities. And so management was changed drastically, and the deputy administrator was placed over the shelter. So he is the number number two man in our shelter, in our uh, county. And new management was put into place from the in the top of the shelter all the way down. And I had only been at the shelter at this point for about a month, doing surgery one day a week because the veterinarian had had quit to go elsewhere as well. And so I met with the deputy administrator. And I begged him to listen to what was going on and to talk to the staff and to find out what was happening. And I knew that there was a better way to do things. 
And I gave him a lot of homework in our very first meeting. I had a, a very large stack of, um, of, of notebooks, and I had a CD and, you know, and a book, and, uh, and I just handed it all to him, and I was extremely upset, I like to call it passionate, um, because I knew that there had to, had to be somebody out there that could actually make these changes and save these animals. And so I think this is a, a big part of where divine intervention comes into play, uh, no matter what you believe. But the year prior to me um, coming on board at the shelter, Target Zero had been invited in. And for those of you not familiar with Target Zero, um, this is Dr. Sarah Pisano and Cameron Moore. And they're now part of Team Shelter USA and the uh, Million Cat Challenge, University of Florida. So they were brought into the shelter a week prior to me coming in. And when I was offered the job, I just thought, well, this is crazy. I don't know any other vets that are, are shelter directors. And I also thought it was crazy from the aspect that I had never managed people before in my life. I was a veterinarian. I, I just wanted to take care of the animals. So Dr. Pisano and, and Cameron show up and they come into the community and they talk to everybody that is involved in animal welfare. You know, they meet with the Humane Society, low-cost spay neuter clinic. They meet with the county administrator and the deputy administrator and county council. And, you know, they come to the shelter and spend time there observing everything that's going on on a daily basis and, and talking to the staff, you know, really figuring out what the true cause is. Um, of, of these problems are and why animals are being euthanized. And so what these incredible women were able to do was put together a plan. And it was a, a fantastic emergency action plan. So these are some things that have to change drastically now um, versus a long-term goal plan for us at the shelter. And so I said that I would, um, would take the job, but there was, was one condition and that was if we followed this plan to a T. I had worked in a shelter before that euthanized animals for space, and I knew that my heart could not take that. And uh, I knew there had to be a better way to do things. So we started out in the shelter by looking at data. And I will tell you right now, that is not my favorite thing to do. Um, I don't enjoy crunching the numbers. Again, I'm a veterinarian. I like to spend a lot of time with my animals. So, you know, but. But it's crucial for growth, and you have to know what you're dealing with in order to succeed and to move forward. So when, I, when we first started at the shelter, there were over 450 animals. They didn't have any sort of daily rounds going on for animal flow. There was inaccurate data, lost animals, wasted animal care days, and there was really no fiscal responsibility. So we're wasting tons of money and then complaining that we don't have money to save animals like we needed to be doing. Um, the, the backlog of animals that were, was, were unaltered was just tremendous. From my standpoint, being the only veterinarian in the building, there was no ordering system in place, no working SOPs. There were lots of parvo and panleukopenia and ringworm and kennel cough. Um, and it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. You know, it, was, it was very, very overwhelming to start with. So we immediately started doing an animal inventory and went ahead and microchipped everybody. And then we started microchipping all animals on intake. We started daily rounds every day. So that's with myself, my intake supervisor, my adoption supervisor, my rescue coordinator, um, doing rounds every single morning, 9 a.m. sharp. That's where you will find us. Um, you know, we're, you need to make sure that every animal is moving in the right direction. Because any day that animal sits there not heading in the right direction is a wasted animal care day. And it's wasted money, and it's a waste of time for that animal's life as well. So that was extremely important for us to make sure that that gets, that gets followed up on. So we had to um, put some other programs into place. So I start, we started a foster to adopt waiver. So it allows an animal to leave our facility the same day it came in while it's still on it. For us, it's a five-day stray hold. Um, if the owner comes in the meantime, then we'll call the foster and they bring the animal back. But if not, they complete their adoption on day six after the animal has completed surgery. So on top of walking into an overcrowded facility, we were running out of supplies. You know, imagine having 200 cats in your facility and no litter boxes. 
or you're running out of dog food, so you're having to send staff to track your supply. Um, you know, it was a it was a very very frustrating time for for everyone in the shelter, and it, it took a lot of organizing to to kind of fix all of those problems. Um, parvo, panluke, ringworm, those animals had always just been immediately euthanized, so I created a parvo ward in order to isolate those animals and treat them. And I did the same thing for panleukopedia and for ringworm, and staff thought I had absolutely lost my mind. Uh, they had always been taught that parvo wasn't a treatable disease and you know, that there was no way to treat for these types of things in the shelter. And so we were we were able to prove them all wrong and uh, and take care of those animals. And, and we, we easily save 80% or more um, of, of the animals that, that have parvo. So we've done a great job with those as well. Um, so this is where Cindy saved the day, and Cindy is my administrative assistant. She has been with the county for almost 20 years, and so she was familiar with all of the um, software and the purchasing requirements that were needed for the county. And so, you know, for me, it was imperative to hire staff that would be able to help the shelter succeed. So she was appointed to do all of our ordering. She, we all started doing the, the animal inventory and figuring out who every single animal was and a supply inventory so that we were no longer running out of these crucial items that we needed in our, in our facility. Um, so we, we were able to do that in order to, to perform our daily operations just as a shelter. We went through the shelter and threw everything out. I don't like a lot of clutter. And there was just junk stuffed in every single crevice and corner that you could possibly imagine. So that was extremely important for me was to make it a safe, clean working environment for everyone. Um, and that includes my staff. So one of the other great things I walked into was cats. There were cats everywhere. They were in inadequate cages, you know, just crammed on top of each other, no portals, you know, no no disease um, was was segregated from the other. Dozens of kittens and crates with upper respiratory infections that were dying. Any animal with, with leukemia or FIV was euthanized. And my, my intake supervisor would come in early in the morning when we were really, really full. And she would help, you know, she would go ahead and, and euthanize these feral cats um, before we really got started so that, uh, so that we would actually have space for more that were coming in. And... Uh, it was it was just devastating to me because there were so many cats and they were in every crate, every office. They were in the ceiling. I'm sure, a lot of you guys are are very used to that, and it can be extremely overwhelming. So I knew that we had to do something really quickly to to move forward and um, be able to save all of these cats. And a community cat program was the only thing that made sense that would allow me to to save these cats. So where do we even start? Um, for me, it was we had to change our ordinance, and we had to get approval to have community cats or a TNR program. So, it, you know, that was key for us was making sure that cats were no longer um, part of the leash law for our county. And the save rate for cats at this point in time was about 26%, so just absolutely abysmal. And these are actually four kittens that, uh, that were, were fostered out and later adopted through our facility last year. So remember when you're talking about county council, it's, it's a group of people that do not necessarily have your particular set of skills. And it only takes one person to sell your message. And this fine gentleman is Tom Allen. And he absolutely loved boxers. And that did it for me. Um, you know, I was able to, to meet with Tom and explain to him and educate him about what needed to happen at the shelter. And he was well respected by the other county council members. And he was then able to sell that message. It was, you know, really, really important for me to explain to him that the the cats that are being seen or heard about in our in our community are really an actually very small part of that population in our town. And so, you know, he was able to take that message forward. And for us, we have seven county council members, but you only need majority. So I only needed to win over four people. But you have to remember that you're the expert in the field. So you have to educate them and tell them what you need from them. 
and explain to them why these are, are really important you know, life-saving uh, measures and how community cats really have that vacuum effect that you know, if you remove them all, more are just going to return. So a common complaint from repeat cat customers at the shelter was that they've been trapping cats and bringing them to the shelter for 15 years. So why would we change anything? And to me, it was just proof, you know, that the trapping and euthanizing doesn't work because you've been catching and bringing cats to the shelter to have them euthanized for 15 years. So we were going to change things up. So that was really important for us. And um, two months in, I was able to, to finally get our ordinance through the third reading, which allowed us to have a community cat program. So it's a free roaming cat that is cared for by a resident in the area. It can be friendly or feral. And they are distinguished from other cats by being sterilized and ear tipped. Um, that also means for us that they have been dewormed and vaccinated for rabies. The other part of the ordinance change was that puppies or kittens under five months of age are no longer subject to a stray hold period when there is a live outcome opportunity. And that has been really crucial for us. You know, that's the most susceptible group of animals in our shelter. We don't want to sit on them. You know, I don't want to hold puppies. No one's ever lost their litter of puppies. Um, or kittens. And so for us, that was really, really crucial to get those young animals right back out the door, whether it's to a rescue group or into a foster home that will hold on to them until they are big enough for spay neuter. And so that was a, a big part of what we had to do. So after getting our ordinance updated, um, my next task, since I had passed an ordinance that animal control would be in, enforcing without consulting them, was to get animal control on board, and they were, were not real happy with me. You know, they, they thought I was insane. They'd never heard of any sort of program. And animal control for Anderson County works directly under the sheriff. They do not work for me at the shelter. And so I could, um, could only ask them nicely to do things for us, um, but they didn't have to do anything for me. And so, you know, one of the big things I had to do was gain their trust. And beg them to stop picking up cats and being that transport company and being, um, you know, a taxi service for cats. And so that was really important for me, although they didn't understand it. Um, but a few months in, you know, I paid for some training for all of us, and we, we went to Atlanta and did some training together for a weekend. And, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time discussing community cats and, and other problems as well. Um, I went to court and testified and, and spent time around the officers then. And, um, you know, they were, they were able to see that they were able to focus on animal cruelty instead of just being that taxi service for, for cats. And so the only cats they bring in now are injured or bite quarantines or any sort of special circumstance. Um, you know, so some elderly person in our community that, that has too many cats or, or has been injured or, or something like that, um, that that may need assistance. And so... In the end, I had met with every municipality in our county and preached about community cats. And I talk about cats all the time. And there was a particular municipality that didn't want to participate in our program. And we don't have any sort of written contract. And so I, I just told them, all right, you know, if you don't want to get on the board, we're going to stop taking your cats. And uh, they immediately called for a, a meeting with city council to solve this disastrous problem. And within 15 minutes of sitting in front of county in a city council, I realized that they were all cat lovers, and they thought that the the um, the idea of euthanizing all of these cats was just absolutely horrible. And so they were immediately on board. And now I am such an advocate for community cats and proof that this program works, um, that this this community cat colony grew on my car and has been multiplying ever since. I'm extremely proud of our community cat program. Um, one of the hardest things was to change staff mindset, and that can really be difficult. You know, I didn't know any of the staff. They had not heard the most pleasant things about me, and I had not heard the most pleasant things about them when I started. And so, you know, most of them had only worked at this particular shelter, and they'd always been taught, we're full, we need to euthanize. And so it was really important for me to preach to them and teach them a different mindset of, hey, guys, we're full. We need to do something else. We need to reach out. We need to promote adoption, whether that be fee waived or just cheaper adoption um, or some sort of, of catchy adoption slogan. We need to, to beg for fosters. We need to reach out to rescue groups. 
we really have to advocate for our animals and look for every possible reason to save them instead of looking for reasons to euthanize and treat each animal like they are an individual. So I think that was really important for us, you know, for, for me to spend a lot of time with my staff in intake um, and, and also in adoption talking to the public so that my staff could hear me and learn how to answer these particular questions along the way. So I had to put together a winning team. And one thing that was really important was to, you know, make sure all the correct people were in those right positions. So make sure the supervisors I had were really skilled at doing their job and not allow one person to just think our shit. You know, everybody has had that, um, had that moment where they were, that one person was stirring up the, a lot of drama and causing a lot of problems. And so it's really important to remember that that one person can make your organization miserable. So it's crucial to have some management in place that can lead and to stop trying to invent the wheel. You know, all of these programs already exist. So it's really important to be able to, to get everybody on the same page and to be able to put together that winning team. So one of the big things I think that a lot of people forget about is why do animal shelters exist? You know, how did we all end up in this business? How do we all have jobs now? And, you know, our responsibility is to protect the citizens in our community. That was why the shelter was, was built in the first place. So it's, it's protecting them from animal health-related diseases and dangerous dogs. We do not exist to be a dumping ground for animals. Every other public health department requires you to have an appointment. And so I think it was really important, you know, for us to remember that. So even the health department, you know, you don't just walk in and, and butt in and say, hey, you know, here I am. I need to see a doctor. Um, you know, you have to make an appointment. And so we have to retrain the public. For so long, we taught them the shelter is, is the best place to take care of an animal. And every animal you find needs to come to the shelter. And that is not the case. You know, we're finding out that we have trained them incorrectly. And it is up to us to retrain the public to know that the shelter is not necessarily the best place for animals, especially if it was their own animal. Um, and so that they need to, to take on some of that responsibility as well. So one of the big things we always talk about is managed admissions. And in order to humanely care for the animals in our facility, we have to try to manage the population. This is where managed admissions become so crucial. We can rarely control the number of animals that animal control brings us, but we can control owner surrenders. And so that has been absolutely game-changing for us, is to make owner surrenders have appointments at least three to four weeks out. Sometimes it may be a little bit more. But they went and purchased that animal or got it from a friend, and they need to take a little bit of responsibility for rehoming it. Um, the, the photograph here is a, a hoarding case that, that went wrong. And, you know, this is just a normal day in the shelter. And so I got a phone call that morning, hey, there's a hoarding case going on, and we need your assistance. And so we took in 48 animals from that particular situation. Um, and that's a lot. You know, it's a lot of stress on the staff. And so in order to to be able to manage that number of animals that we have in our facility and be able to take care of animals in these terrible situations, it is crucial that we are able to, to have open kennels when we need them. And, uh, and a big part of that is, is by making appointments for owner surrenders. We also make appointments for stray animals, and so we will beg anybody in the public that finds an animal to, to go ahead and foster that animal for us. Um, and a lot of times they think that they are you know, doing the right thing, they found a stray litter of kittens or, or puppies and, or a, a dog even. And, um, you know, we, we ask them very, very nicely to foster for us. Uh, most people want to do the right thing. And so I think that's the, the key, you know, one of my favorite songs, most people are good. And often in animal welfare, we forget that. And we think, oh, people are stupid and, you know, why can't they just take care of their animals and most people actually want to do the right thing or help. And so we have built an amazing foster program by using people that were trying to turn in animals. So that helps us to keep underage kittens and puppies out of the shelter until they're at least eight weeks of age so that their immune system is a little stronger, they've been vaccinated, they're big enough for surgery. Um, and, you know, we're putting some of that responsibility back on the public. So they found these animals. We'll supply them with anything that they may need to foster. And, um, you know, many of these people will come back and foster for us over and over again. 
And so that's been a really rewarding change for us. Instead of just lying or just taking on that burden or me trying to overburden my staff by, you know, making them take home all of these underage kittens, um, you know, I, I put the responsibility right back on the public. And this the slide here, the, the woman in the middle brought me some kittens, and it was exactly that. She, she wanted to turn them in because she loved kittens so much, and she just couldn't stand to see these kittens outside. And so when I explained everything to her and how much we needed her help, she, she jumped into action, and she has been one of our ma most amazing fosters, and she raised them and adopted one of those kittens. And now she has put together food drives and, and product drives for us, um, and she continues fostering for us. So, you know, that's a, a tremendous way for us to get a lot of support through these different foster homes and, um, and by, by asking the public for their help. So transparency is key, and my staff will tell you, you know, do not ever lie to me. Being honest is, is really all you have. Your word is all you have. And if someone will lie to you, they will steal from you. So being transparent is, um, is one of the most important things that you can do. And you have to be honest with the public. You know, look, we don't have room for this animal. I'm not going to go back there and euthanize another animal in order to take in your dog today. Or, you know, I'm not going to let these kittens sit here and get sick and die. Um, I need your help. And we are brutally honest with our community. You know, they do care and they want to help. And if they're angry, it's most likely for a very valid concern. You know, every time I hear, oh, well, the, the public's just angry about what we're doing, you're, there's probably something going on that's not right. Um, you know, open your doors. Let them, let them in. Allow them to help in any way that they possibly can. You will benefit and the animals will benefit and your staff will benefit and your community will benefit. And I think that's been one of the biggest changes for us um, in, in the way that the public now talks about us and donates to us, which has been tremendous, and, and offers their support. And so I think that is a, a huge, huge key. And you also have to remember that your volunteers are working for free. So everyone talks about not enough, not enough help, not enough employees, not enough labor. You've got a ton of volunteers out there that actually want to come work at your shelter. So take advantage of that. Be brutally honest. Let them do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and and our, we have a very open-door policy. If the shelter volunteers can come in, they can work, they can do whatever, whatever they need to do at, at our facility to, to make them feel wanted and to help out our animals and our staff. So another program that we have is our, our intake diversion. And I think it's really important to remember that um, any, just about anything you can do to keep an animal out of your shelter is going to be cheaper than taking that animal into your shelter. So intake diversion could be, you know, running a food bank, which we, we have a, a great food bank right now. And, uh, you know, anybody can come in. They can get food from us. If their animals are not spayed or neutered, then we make sure that they are. If they can't afford it, we do it for free. If they need medical assistance, we will give them medical assistance. Um, this week I had a, a little kitty come in, and she had – a big mammary tumor, and she'd shown up at this guy's house about a month ago, and his children were just absolutely in love with her, and, and he didn't have money. So, you know, he, he needed some assistance for that dog, and, and she needed some help as well. So we went ahead and spayed her, removed her mammary tumors, and we were able to help them both. Um, do they just need spay-neuter? Do they need fencing or dog houses or runners in order to keep them legal and compliant? Um, do they need dog training? We have a, a dog trainer on staff that can go out to their house and interact with them and see what's going on with her and, uh, you know, and try to help them however they can to, to keep that animal in their home. Um, the dog in the picture, his name was Monster, and he ate a corn cob. And he had been at two other um, private veterinary clinics, and his family couldn't afford the surgery for him. And, you know, they were, were absolutely struggling because they didn't want to euthanize this dog. They adored him. So when I got a phone call about him, I said, yeah, bring him in. You know, let's see what we can do. And that, to me, doing the right thing um, for this dog is the most important thing you can ever possibly do. So a week after foreign body surgery, removing that corn cob, um, Monster is now back home sleeping with his little girl. And all three family members in the photo cried 
and Monster screamed, um, that, that adorable little pit bull scream, uh, when, he, when he saw his family and, and was reunited. And so, you know, doing anything you can to, to keep these animals out of the shelter, to keep them healthy, keep them in homes where they're already loved, is, is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, it's a, a big part of what we do at our facility is how can I help you? What's it going to take for you to keep your animals? So I touched, touched on foster to adopt just a little bit earlier, um, but with, with our owner return rate for dogs at about 10%, um, you've got 90% of the dogs that are coming into your shelter that are not being um, reclaimed by their owner. And so our Foster to Adopt program is just that. It is a program that allows a dog to leave our facility the same day that it comes into the shelter. So you're moving those highly adoptable dogs very, very quickly. The dog remains visible on our website in case someone is looking for it. And it's all, a picture of that dog is also posted on a board in our lobby. Um, and if the owner comes looking for it, then we will call the foster and tell them that they need to bring the dog back. If the owner does not come, then the dog has surgery on day six, and these people are then able to complete their adoption. And in the meantime, I didn't have to feed this dog. I didn't have to pay my staff to clean up after this dog. Um, the dog didn't have to be stressed out staying in a kennel you know, where it was not, um, not the most comfortable situation. Any shelter um, is, is not going to be as good as, as any home you know, across the board for, for most cases. So this really decreases your length of stay. It decreases our cost, and it, it drastically decreases our animal inventory. So anything we can do to get these animals you know, out of the building and into their potential home has, has been a tremendous cost-saving and um, an animal-saving practice for us. One of the other things that was going on um, was, uh, you know, are you hurting your adoption? Are you judging? Stop doing the judging and start educating these people. People come to the animal shelter because they love animals. And so, you know, when I started, pit bulls had to have a home check. So every pit bull had to have a home check, which wasn't happening. And so by trying to protect pit bulls, they were actually causing more of them to be euthanized than they were helping. And so it's extremely important to remember um, to build a relationship with those adopters, and then you will be able to help the animals in return. So one of our favorite things to read is the adopter's welcome manual. And, uh, you know, you have to look at it from a different perspective and make sure that you're doing the right thing, that you're not judging these people, um, that, that they are going to do what is best and what is the right thing by these animals. You know, they come into the shelter for the right reason, and they, they absolutely want to find that perfect pet. Um, another big part of our program is through rescue and transport partners. And these could be local partners, such as the Greenville Humane Society and Carolina Poodle Rescue, uh, Day Before the Rainbow, or these could be you know, far away. So we have rescues in New Jersey and St. Hubert, Operation Pause for Homes, Aubrey Rescue in Vermont, and then transport partners as well. So we worked really hard, and over the 10 years that I was in, um, have been in animal welfare, I've built a, a great relationship with a lot of these guys. So when I first started at Pause, I made a lot of phone calls. I was like, look, guys, we're in bad shape. I need help. And so I was able to call on a lot of my friends to, to swoop down and help, you know, pull these animals, get them to safety, transport them, um, and, and make sure that they were, um, you know, taken care of in the, the best way possible. One of the big things I hear about in the South is heartburn. And, um, you know, mosquitoes are our state bird around here. So, so at least 25%, if not more, of the dogs that come into our facility do test positive for heartworms. And one of the big things for my staff was, um, you know, again, it's treatable. So stop treating these dogs any differently. Stop singling them out. Stop scaring people from adopting them. Um, and, and treat them. They're already in a shelter. You know, our length of stay right now is, is about 35 days, which is very long. Um, we've, we've had some long-term dogs. But so they're in a confined space. You know, that, that's an ideal situation for these dogs that, that have heartworms. So day five, they get surgery and their first heartworm injection of amidocide. And day six, they get their second amidocide injection. 
um, and then they are, are ready to, to go, be adopted. If they are high positive or older or symptomatic or anything like that, we, we do change up our protocol. But, but that was a big part for us was to stop scaring people, you know, stop treating these dogs any differently. Just go ahead and treat them. It, it doesn't cost thousands of dollars like everyone likes to, to think um, and, and make sure you're doing what's best for each dog individually. So again, medical cases are, are very important. You know, we do get a lot of those and rescues can't take on that burden um, of every injured animal. And so, you know, make sure that you're, you're treating them appropriately, that they are getting proper care. You know, proper pain management is crucial in any facility. Um, and then, you know, another part was making sure that your rescues are informed. So we purchased a digital x-ray system so that I could figure out what was going on, so that I could help these rescues so that we get these animals to the best potential new home or rescue possible. So that was really crucial for us as well. Um, standards of care. And so for me, you know, being a, a, a no-kill shelter or, or saving over 90% every single month um, is, is amazing, but it doesn't do us any good if we're not following the standards of care. If animals are suffering or you're just warehousing them, um, then you're not doing them any good. And so, you know, that was one of the big things for me is make sure that the animal's quality of life comes first. And I ask myself every single day, is this animal better off today than they were yesterday? And if not, something needs to change. So, you know, we installed cat portals. We changed to a cleaner litter. All animals got fed twice a day. Um, all of the cats get canned food every single day. Dogs got caranda beds. We changed to one consistent um, dog food so that the, the GI upsets weren't as prevalent. Guillotine doors were installed in the pod. Um, we're working on the rest of those as well to make sure that my staff stays safe. Um, you know, some of these dogs can be extremely aggressive in, in certain situations. And so that was extremely important for me was to make sure that my staff was safe, uh, make sure it's easier for my staff to clean and to take care of these animals and make sure that they, the animal needs are being met as well. So this is probably one of my favorite slides, and it says, come out from behind the dumpster. And that is a photo of me back behind one of our dumpsters. Um, everyone that works at the animal shelter knows that every day is not just playing with puppies and kittens. Um, there are some really, really tough days. And, you know, I know prior to my, my coming on board at, at PAWS, the staff was working really, really hard. Um, but we had to change that and make sure that we were doing a better job. And so I remember when I first started, I, uh, I was overwhelmed and I had been arguing with animal control all day about community cats and they just hated it. And I remember my staff being mad because we had parvo puppies and they were having to, to clean up after the parvo puppies now instead of being able to euthanize them. And, and everything had changed and change can be extremely difficult for an organization. And so I remember calling Dr. Pisano in tears you know, they all hate me and, and nothing is working and I just don't know what to do and I don't know what to say. And, and I, I remember her, you know, you suck it up and you get back in there and you tell them this and this and this. And, uh, and, and making sure that you have that mentor that will support you no matter what because not every day is going to be a cakewalk. Sometimes it's going to be very difficult and you're going to have sad days and really sad stories and, um, you know, you just have to remember to, to take a deep breath, to find your mentor, to call them when you need them, and beg for a little bit of help, and to come out from behind the dumpster. And then this slide is a repeat, but I think it's extremely important to ask your community for help. Stop hiding behind those fears and to make sure your community knows what you need. They do care. They want to help. They want to save the animals. People aren't stupid. They want to do the right thing, and most people are really good. So, you know, I have 19 full-time staff members. I have about 12 part-time staff members taking care of, you know, over 6,000 animals a year. But I have 200,000 people in my community. So what difference can 200,000 people make, whether they are volunteering or donating or spreading the word or coming over and, and walking dogs, or even just now they are our Facebook community and they support us. And if someone has something negative to say, 
they will step up. And so we no longer even have to um, to, to police Facebook or social media. And so that's, that's huge. Make sure you're asking your community for assistance. And then this was a big one for me. You must not be afraid to dream a little bigger, my dear. You know, I, I didn't know what I was getting into when I when I started all of this, and and I will tell you that I was I was afraid. There were some days where I thought there is no way this is going to work, um, but I knew I knew there was a better way to do things, and I knew that we could save lives, and I knew that um, that if I just dreamed a little bit bigger, that we would be successful, and we have absolutely done that. In the past two and a half years, have been mind-blowing for me. And animal welfare has changed so drastically in the past 10 years um, that you have to look look ahead and say, oh my gosh, where are we going to be in another 10 years? And and, um, and scare yourself just a little bit. And so to me, that has been absolutely uh, just, just mind-blowing to see the progress that we've made and to know it is possible for every facility um, across the country. So, you know, those are, those are the big ones for me. So, Thank you guys for your time, and I'm going to go back to those questions that we had. Um, I think there may be a few more other questions along the way, too. Um, so, you know, here was the first question that we talked about, some of the most difficult programs that you've tried to implement in your community, and how can we be successful in, in helping you change that and be, uh, be successful in your own community as well? And then uh, what fears are preventing you from moving forward? So. Go ahead, Bruce, if you've got anything else to add. Well, we have some questions coming in. I, we do want people to respond to these things, and we'll uh, address them. But while we're waiting for that, there's some questions waiting, and I go ahead and uh, get those out to you so we can uh, respond to them. I'll go ahead and read it while we're waiting. Uh, the first question is, we rescue neonatal kittens only. Many are sick when they come in. How would you go about immediately getting these into fosters when most are not very knowledgeable? Um, you know, I think that's a, a big thing for us is that I forget my first day as a veterinary uh, assistant or a vet tech or a, a kennel cleaner. Um, you know, I didn't start out knowing everything about neonatal kittens, and you've got to start somewhere. But there are a lot of fantastic um, tools out there now. With the, the Maddie's Foster app is available, which is huge. There's some really amazing, um, you know, YouTube videos out there, you know, my, uh, my foster coordinator does not stay on the phone and not available after hours, um, but we do give them medications and we educate them the best we absolutely can. You know, kittens are always going to be tough, but, you know, I haven't found anyone yet that, that wasn't able to catch on. You know, some of the kittens may not thrive, but, but there are very few people that you can't actually teach um, to, to bottle feed and, and clean some butts. So, you know, don't be afraid. You know, they may not do the exact same job that I may do as a veterinarian, but what they're doing is crucial to your organization. And so I think that's, that's just absolutely important. You know, don't be afraid to teach them and teach them and teach them. Make some great videos. That's the easiest way to do it. However, they can watch it over and over and over until they actually get it and, and catch on. Excellent. Um, how do we get the kill shelter managers and local governments to look at the other options instead of killing? And also, when is our county drowning in uh, HW positive dogs and mostly pit bulls and pit mixes? How do we save those dogs? So, you know, that's my favorite. Every community says, oh, you're not like mine. We have pit bulls. I have pit bulls as well. You know, I have 132 adult dogs in my shelter today, and at least 100 of those are pitties or pity mixes. Um, so, you know, stop treating them any differently. They're all the same. I don't even like for my staff to, to try to label dogs. I want them to all be American shelter dogs. Let the public choose what breed it is. Um, but a lot of times with your local government, you, you're just going to have to start making some noise. If things aren't going well, if things aren't going appropriately, um, you know, again, they need to be educated. And so a big part of of what happened in Anderson County was the public got mad and they started getting very vocal about it. And then the best part was that, um, you know, a third party assessment was made. So reach out to these groups, um, you know, Team Shelter USA and, and Dr. Pisano or myself or Cameron Moore from the University of Florida or Target Zero. Um, I think those are crucial, you know, because a lot of times, um, the squeaky wheel in the community is just seen as the crazy cat person or the crazy animal lover. Um, but, but these third-party assessments are absolutely key. And, and 
they know what to say, they know who they need to meet, um, and, and they know how to word things in order to get some serious change going in your communities. Okay, excellent. Do you have a specific partner rescue that works with your shelter? And if so, have you had issues working with a partner and how was it resolved? I have a specific partner rescue. Um, I have a lot of different rescue groups that we work with. So we have some breed specific that are, are nearby. We have some you know, across the country. Um, and so, you know, most of them I have a, a very good working relationship with. Um, we have had issues working with, with certain partners, and it just depends on what that issue may be. A lot of you know the drama involved, and, you know, particular rescues want things done a particular way. And uh, to be honest with you, I just give them whatever they want. I bend over backwards to, to make that partnership work. Um, you know, as long as they are doing what's best for the animals, I will step up and do whatever it is that they may want. Some want fecals before transport. Some want a, an IDEX, you know, uh, 40X test and not just a heartworm test. Um, and, and some of the stuff seems kind of crazy, but, you know, whatever makes them happy and keeps them working with us to, to save lives is what we will do. So I put my ego aside and I, I do what's best for these animals. Very good. Now, now I know HW plus means heartworm positive. Now I know. Heartworm positive. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little better off for this experience. Uh, next good. question we have is, uh, can you share this, these things with us, like your charts of Parvo and anything else that will uh, help other shelters become a viable shelter saving lives? Our Long Beach shelter is in dire need of help. So charts as far as my treatment charts or just certain things that we've done. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to share anything at all um, at any point in time. So please, uh, you know, feel free to reach out. You guys are more than welcome to reach out at any point. Um, you know, we're, we're like I said, we're 100% transparent. We're happy to help any facility, um, you know, to, to be able to reach these same goals as well. All right. I got another question here. And this one is... Uh, my group is a no-kill rescue group, and we try to be as careful as possible about adopting cats and kittens out, and we turn away a lot of adoption applications. How careful should we be? Turning people down or killing too young or having young children in the home or adopting out to the elderly, what is a good guideline for adoption application review? We don't want for these cats to wind up being abused or back out on the street or being let outside or being hit by a car. How do you assess whether an adopter is a good home? Yeah, so that's a, you know, that can be a real challenge. And for me um, and, and our facility with over 6,000 animals a year coming through, um, you know, we have a very open adoption application and, and process. We talk to them. We try to educate these people. Um, you know, if you came to my house and did a home visit, you would probably not give me another pit bull because I have at least nine of my own and a couple of foster dogs. Um, I have a, a herd of donkeys and horses and cats. Um, and so, you know, you would say, oh, well, she, she obviously doesn't need another animal. Um, you know, so, so we can't be so judgmental. And, um, you know, as far as them being let outside or being hit by a car, I've had cats that did not want to live inside at all. Um, and, you know, they were happier being outside. And, yeah, anything can happen. Um, unfortunately, I ran over one of my own dogs. And uh, she's fine now, but you know accidents can always happen. So I think, as a as a rescue group, you get the ability to turn in, to turn adopters away as an open admissions facility where I have you know hundreds of animals coming in every single month. We don't get that, but there's plenty of proof out there that fee waived adoptions and open adoptions do not lead to um, to a lack of of good adopters or, or good homes for these animals. So, you know, I think you really have to look at that and, um, you know, kind of look at your own situation, your own home, and, um, and judge and see what would happen next. All right. Well, thank you. I uh, did get a response from the um, person that had the question about uh, the, the, the place in Long Beach, and you had said, okay. uh, you know, charts on what, and she says basically everything you have done. So she wants to, uh, she wants to get all the information she can. I'm sure there are ways that um, uh, anyone attending this uh, event can contact you for further clarifications and things like that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so my email is ka Sanders at andersoncountysc.org. 
And um, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to share you know, any of our experiences along the way. There's a, a lot of a lot of information, but some some pretty practical programs that we were able to implement in order to make this really successful. All right. Well, I have another question here, and uh, this one is. Um, what do you treat young kittens with before they go to fosters as far as deworming, flea treatments, antibiotics, et cetera? And do you send these meds with fosters? We do, absolutely. Yep, we'll send um, anything with a foster that they may need. So crates, litter, pee pads. Um, we, we deworm, so we use Pyrantal and Proziquantal and Marquee. We do flea treatments as well. Um, we, I use a lot of azithromycin for my kittens, um, so once a day antibiotic or um, you know eye medications too. So yep, absolutely, we send those with um, with a foster anything that they may need in order to to treat them. Excellent. Well, um, that's the end of our presentation. Uh, many thanks to Dr. Sanders and all of you for sharing your time with us. Your opinion is important to us, so please take a moment to fill out the evaluation survey by clicking on the link on the screen. And also be sure and register for and attend the next and final presentation in our life-saving series. This one's called Let Them Go Home, Increasing Adoptions with Monica Frendon from Austin Pets Alive. Mark your calendars for Thursday, December 13th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. You can find more free educational opportunities on our website at maddiesfun.org and our, uh, on Maddie's University at maddiesuniversity.org. Again, thanks for your participation in our webcast. Have a great evening.